Hello, guys. Top of the morning to you. I want to talk about the promised land. I've been thinking about it for the last week as I was producing these two theory videos, which check them out if you haven't. Such information law dumps there. Crazy out there catawalling of concepts um, that might take a bit to digest, but if for anything like it's done for me, absolutely deepen your appreciation and your brain canons for the Seven Remake Trilogy, and just where it can potentially go. But the, but the, the scope of what I thought this story could do thematically, narratively, philosophically, has just, it's just ratcheted up so much higher. And yeah, one of those aspects was Yoga Kara. Um, but as I've been exploring that, one thing that's popped up again and again is the Promised Land. So yeah, I covered Maitreya, the future Buddha with the yellow flowers, has a flower growing contest with an evil usurper, <laughs> just like we're seeing Aerith and Sephiroth in the game. Uh, and that uh, Matria makes a promise to the world. Aerith's theme song is promise or weaves of the concept of promise. Um, Mat Matreya's promise is that when yeah the planet is about to destroy itself, the ecology is absolutely destroyed. He'll come back and lead them to a land of bounty where there's no sycophancy, deceit, and basically spiritual revolution. So that theme of promise coming from Maitreya, Maitreya's an Aerith parallel, and Yogacara, I thought, okay, so then what does this make the promised land? Now, I'm just going to ask you guys, what is the promised land to you at this point? Let me know in the comment section below. What do you what do you think it is? What have you uh, hinged on? Because, of course, Maitreya's promise will actually be de delivered to the physical world. So humans will have a spiritual upgrade and then they'll actually create right, cities and cultures and civilizations actually in harmony with the planet. Something that we saw, obviously, in the VR machine, Neo Midgar. Though that was propaganda bullshit, we saw a version of Midgar that was eco-friendly it was clean it wasn't polluted there was life teeming all around it and i'm like that smells like that would be my Treya's promised land delivered to the physical world but we've had so many other versions of what promised land is and i think this is the point of it that we're supposed to consider it on multiple planes of existence because <laughs> follow me we've obviously had the premise that the promised land is only reserved for the central right when we go on that interpretation, things like Crisis Core, the gift of the goddess, you know, the conclusion that that came to is just more direct and simple. The promised land is the life stream, the place where you go after you die. But then the question is, why is it reserved for Cetra? Because we know that humans, when they die, they go back into the conscious pool of everything and their life force is cycled into the planet. That applies for humans. So it can't just be you die and you merge back with everything. That's the promised land. That's too narrow an interpretation to be the full conclusion. I mean, but it is still correct because obviously we saw the G tribe, they get rejected from the live stream. They were never born from the live stream, so they can't go back to it. So they are rejected from a promised land. So the different distinctions between different races and species is a thing. I mean, we saw obviously with Aerith wall painting, right? That's where uh, Barrett suddenly dunks the promised land prophecy. And Aerith's like, well, you know it. And he's like, yeah, Shinra have no goddamn right taking your people's land again implying exclusivity to the cetera and even the first time we ever heard about it in og uh, this was a quote from Aerith in the shinra headquarters all i know is the cetera were born from planet speak with it unlock it and then the cetera will return to the promised land the cetera will a land that promises supreme happiness someday i'll get out of midgar speak with the planet and find my promised land that's what mum said that's what Fauna said but even the interpretation of that later changes because Elder Hargo at Cosmo Canyon basically says the promised land. You want to know what well, I think? There is no one place called the promised land. That's what I believe. And then he kind of goes, no, no. But I do think it exists like it did for the ancients. The resting place is the place for the ancients who, you know, go on this continuous journey of you know, nurturing the planet. I believe that for the ancients, that's what it was. So we know that if Fauna, uh, from Maiden who travels the planet, returned back like, to the planet very long ago. Aerith basically says, my mum isn't in here. 
in this like intermediary space because Aerith is in live stream chapter white and Maiden which I'm just going to quickly say it frustrates me so much when I do these theory videos and I can drop like 20 30 like succulente concepts and somebody just the only comments is to nitpick Maiden in terms of the planet isn't canon <laughs> Really, dude? In all of that, that's all you've got to contribute. Uh, it's not even true. It's semi-canon, okay? It was co-written by someone else, but Najima read it, approved it, and kind of put it into the like, actual Final Fantasy fan base circulation. So there are things within it that he's absolutely conceptually in step with. And we know that because Maiden is the prime piece of Ultimania material, or novella, that talks about whispers. It references it like four... Three, four, five times. I think it's like four. And obviously we've now got whispers in the game. It's also the most substantive piece of lore that we have on what happens to Aerith after she dies. What's happening in the live stream. What's happening with purity and corruption. White whispers, black whispers. Uh, Sephiroth, what he's doing, what he's trying to manifest. And why Aerith is kept around to try to stop him a higher purpose. Though she feels this want and this urge to return back... It, that's not as strong as her want to stay around to help her crew, to help Cloud. By that standard, because that's what Aerith wanted, she had to stay individualised. She couldn't go back to the planet. So her want, her, her Dharma, and this is where you know, the concept of Yogacara and Dharma and Enlightenment, aka following your life's purpose until you reach that stage of enlightenment, her Dharma at that point was to stay individualised, which makes it her promised land. And that's how Maiden describes it. I read this before, but uh, Aerith says it's okay. There are still people using chainsaws when you're trying to record goddamn juicy videos. We shut the door. Sorry if you can hear that in the background. God damn it. Inconsiderate <laughs> assholes. Um, she says there are still people I don't want to be separated from. I can't sleep yet. Until that time comes, I'll wander around here for a while. I'll spend my time here in the planet in our promised land. This is what made me release this video, The Death of a Goddess. Um, the idea that Aerith will return. This, like, returning to the planet fully is just yet to come. I can't sleep yet until that time comes. And that would be super powerful for us to see Aerith basically self-delete. And it wouldn't be self-deletion, it would be in the eyes of us humans because we kind of see identification, ego annihilation as kind of eradication of all you are. But that's not the most enlightened perspective, certainly of the Setra and certainly not of the Yogacaric Buddhists. The entire purpose is to basically get out of the cycle of rebirth, to follow your life doing virtuous deeds, virtuous actions, Going through the motions, the wheel of samsara, uh, the phases of sunyata, until eventually you go to nirvana. No more reincarnating back. Complete freedom of the self. That's the goal. That's the attainment. That's like ultimate liberation. When I thought about it in that context, so is the promised land nirvana? Is it enlightenment? Okay, well, what plane of existence does that operate on what does that actually make the promised land so is the promised land returning to the planet or is it individualization well that's why i suddenly realized well it's both i think it's all of them the promised land is an idea it's a metaphor the promised land is wherever you are supposed to truly be on your soul's journey right now and that you are following your dharma because anyone who follows their dharma they are also free from suffering because your path is essentially your truth and if you live by your truth then you're free from suffering and that's why enlightenment is achievable on multiple planes of reality and i think that the stamp timelines are just here to be a representation a a, a sandbox if you will to portray these different aspects because enlightenment is Something that, of course, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have achieved in the real world. My Maitreya, the future Buddha, will come back with his yellow flowers. And he's enlightened. The OG Buddha was enlightened. There are numerous enlightened souls who live in the physical world. So, in the physical world, they've achieved their promised land. We also know that some Buddhas, like the future one, he hasn't completely dissolved into Nirvana he is waiting there. He is serving in the spirit world, if you will, waiting to return. So 
Buddhas who are individualized, enlightened beings that haven't, I think they call it, um, oh, I know this is in Hinduism, but I'm sure Buddhism shares a version. I'm trying to remember the exact term for it. There's like like different names for different versions of, of Buddhas. Like there's some that are, and, and they parallel it with the moon and the sun. Some are destined to go to the sun, which is essentially what the Kether is in the Kabbalah, which is returning to the planet, returning to the everything. And then some decide voluntarily to go to the side of the moon, which is actually staying around, staying closer to the world. Think of this ingredients of the life stream. You saw you know, some Setra down here ready to dissolve, like the uh, ones that lost their voice in the ancient temple. And of course we know that Aerith is the closest to the surface because she's going and she's helping other souls. And by that logic, actually inviting them into her promised land so the reason why Jesse, Biggs and Wedge are showing up in Rebirth, we got the story of it. Aerith went and they weren't individualized. They were basically just floating energy. But Aerith could sense because of her Setra power, the karmic, god damn this chainsaw, it's getting louder. <laughs> uh, because of their karmic bag baggage, she can basically detect that. And of course they had a lot of uh, regret and hold up and hang ups. Uh, but they're not themselves. And what Aerith does, very curiously, is she goes up and she lem lends them her memories, es essentially something identifiable, a nexus point in which the soul can uh, coalesce and then bring themselves back. And then they're like, they come back to individualization. Oh yeah, I'm Biggs. Oh, this is what I felt. I'm Jesse, I'm Dean. Um, and this thing of her lending their memories to do that, we actually saw it in Remake. You know the ghosts in the train graveyard? They were just um, you know, formless bags with the tears just floating about. What did we see? Aerith touched them. They then became the uh, ghosty forms of actual children from the, the Bag Baggingtons. And as they are the children, what happens? Suddenly young Aerith is sat in the middle and she's remembering and we're seeing physically manifested a memory of her as a child playing hide and seek alone hugging her knees wanting to be found that's because her memory is what allows them to do that so by that logic guys that's why i landed on so is individualization the promised land and yeah that quote from maiden who travels the planet kind of implies that's the case i'll spend my time here in the planet in our promised land so it's exactly where you need to be at that point um, but just adding on now the physical world, obviously in Rebirth we saw Song as well as Barrett and the gang. Uh, when they got to the Temple of the Ancients, they were like, is this the promised land? And Earth is like, nah, this is too bloody miserable here. This can't be it. Because again, it's supposed to be free from suffering. Rufus Shinri in OG, uh, when he got to the Northern Crate, he's like, yo, this is the promised land. I'm telling you straight up. Uh, <laughs> he was utterly convinced that was it. I've seen some theories online saying that actually Midgit itself is the promised land. It's just one that, because of its spiritual degradation, uh, is no longer perceived as that. And, you know, you've got, like, Buddhist themes of this, even Christian ones. You know, the kingdom of heaven is here on earth, that the promised land is all around, just like heaven and nirvana. Like, alignment is attainable at any moment if there's an ideological switch. And who do we know is also trying to become enlightened in his own dark, nefarious way? Sipihirofe. Sephiroth. Right? This is what really shattered my perception of the promised land. He is described as creating his own promised land. Actually, before I quickly cover that one, um, I'll quickly say Cloud's one. At the end of Advent Children, and in the 10th uh, Ultimania, I think it's more direct there. The 10th Ultimania says, uh, where he awakes... That is Cloud's promised land. So when he wakes up in Aerith's church, that is his promised land. As he sleeps, Cloud hears the voices of two people. Two people dear to him are no longer with him. They tell him teasingly that there is no place with them yet. So this one's too big to adopt. <laughs> when they're standing, when Zack and Aerith are standing over Cloud. Uh, when he wakes up, he sees his friends. He sees the children. He sees Tifa, Marlene, Denzel with hands outstretched, asking to be healed of his geostigma, his family was waiting for him. Surrounded by bliss, he realises this is where he is meant to live. He realises he has forgiven himself. So that's Cloud's promised land. 
Um, and when he turns around, he sees her, Aerith, leaving, along with the friend, Zack, who gave his life for Cloud. They see Cloud is no longer suffering, alone, and say, so they too go off to where they belong, back to the flow of life around the planet. Oh, that was Cloud's promised land. Now, does that mean that Cloud is enlightened? Well, that's the thing. Enlightenment, by Buddhist standards, is... You know, and the guy I've been listening to a 52-part series on, they describe it as it's not like an on and off switch. You can lose it, gain it, lose it, gain it, again and again. That attainment isn't linear. It's actually a constant cycle of stepping on the path and off the path. And, and in fact, there's actually no attaining enlightenment. Uh, I love the quote that technically there are no enlightened beings. There are only enlightened actions. But this phrase also works... On the inverse, that there are no inherently evil people. There are no evil people. They're just evil action. And this is why I think the ultimate, uh, well, Maiden, the novella, said the promised land that Sephiroth had in mind was much different. He was trying to create it all by force. He was going to wound the planet on purpose so that almost all the energy would gather in one place, so that he could control it himself alone. That was the promised land Sephiroth wanted. <laughs> Very, very interesting. Now, I, I got my brain riddling over this because uh, I really thought, well, ideolo ideologically, if the promised land is just achieving within yourself spiritually the things that liberate you from suffering, again, supreme happiness implies no suffering, how can Sephiroth have a promised land? Because all he is is about suffering, right? Sowing suffering, bringing suffering to the planet. But then I suddenly thought, well, actually, is he himself suffering? Now, we would say yes, because we can see the roadmap of you know, his wounded childhood, never being showing love, the abandonment of his friends. But what if, philosophically, Sephiroth actually isn't in any kind of suffering? Again, we know he had to cast parts of himself off into the live stream. And we know that kind of his higher purpose, his dharma, is in a way to bring salvation to the world. The villains of many stories are actually like agents that all the wrongdoings, all the woes, all the mishaps and misdeeds of the world are channeled through. And that by resolving the villain, you resolve the inherent issues in the planet. And in that kind of crazy way, their dharma, their higher purpose, how they serve the planet is actually through their misdeeds. So then are they actually walking their path to their the dharma the higher pu highest purpose and then when i look at S sephiroth does he look like he's suffering really he looks like he loves it the way that he even embraces cloud and has these kind of the semi yaoi like you just have a straight up crush on cloud like it's like he loves cloud but in a super messed up manipulate twist him uh, controlling jaded ex-girlfriend but i've started to think that Sephiroth actually does view suffering as love. He actually does view it as liberation. Because you've got lines like, those who see with clouded eyes see nothing but shadows. Um, the really big one in Rebirth was when he's taking Cloud on a little cosmos journey. Come with me and you'll be in a world of Final Fantasy V stamp timelines multiversity. Um, what did he say? Listen, Cloud, listen to the planet. Cloud clings his head in pain. They're screaming, they're screaming. He can't even bear to listen to it because it's so painful, the suffering that Cloud is hearing. And what's Sephiroth doing? He's like, ah, oh. <laughs> listen to her rapture. He describes it as rapture. Again, hearing and seeing are just two of the eight stages of Yoga Kara consciousness. When two of his senses... Ear consciousness and eye consciousness actually sees suffering and hears suffering and actually interprets it as beautiful, as rapture. That's legitimately how he sees it. And this is where like the one-winged angel, the fallen angel, uh, does Satan, the devil himself, who was once you know, the right hand of God, actually serve the world a purpose. That there is actual divinity hidden within what we call malevolence and evil. Now, I want to dive a little bit deeper into what that means, because if one of the planes of the Promised Land 
you know, humans might actually achieve the promised land with Neo Midgar. Midgar revolutionized into an eco city. And the promised land is something that changes depending on the person. For Cloud, it was just living in his family unit with the people he loved and forgiving himself. It can be like if Fauna actually was returning back to the, the, the planet. And for Zack and for Aerith and whatnot, it's individualization. Well, what we know with the Aerith's dream date, now, this notion of her being able to invite souls into it is something that obviously makes her what we are now describing as omni Aerith. Did Manx Dude make up this term? I really like it. I always just called it Goddess Aerith, but Omni Aerith is, is cool, cool way of describing it. Obviously what we know is that she has amalgamated short loads of souls. Like they've actually completely merged with her. Again, I can't emphasize how huge it is that when we say Omni Aerith, we're not just talking about Aerith with super high fantasy life stream god powers. It's actually a collective. Zack technically is also Omni Aerith. Not Zack when he's in the physical world like he is now. Well, technically, probably metaphysical world. Like Biggs as well. But on a soul level, they are all on the Aeriths. They're all the yellow flowers. That's how I'm choosing to look at it. And that's why I said, yeah, social memory complex, right? The Law of One says that a social memory complex is souls amalgamating together because they serve one another. In service, the separation of self and other uh, becomes so meaningless pointless and, and even undesirable, that they actually merge and then it becomes more than just the soul, it becomes a social memory complex, something much bigger, more powerful. This is what a god or omni Aerith would essentially be. So if Aerith is inviting souls into her promised land to make that, then what's Sephiroth been doing? Because he too is a social memory complex. Again, I pointed to Glenn Lobbrook at the end of Rebirth. That scene with Rufus, when Glenn and Sephiroth were merging and even... The lines was Glenn and Sephiroth. That scene, I couldn't... When I first saw it, I was like, yo, this is interesting that they're putting this in the ending. Very interesting. This must be really significant. But as I was looking at it, I was like, really, is this just about the whole Glenn pushing Rufus towards you know, doing the Wu-Tai War? I get that. More war on the planet equals more suffering. And, okay, wait, hold up. Glenn is Sephiroth. Wait, so is it Glenn or Roth? No, it's both. That's what I've arrived at. They're both. One being. Glenn Lobbrook right now has merged his soul with Sephiroth and is part of the Omni Sephiroth social memory complex. And that, yeah, the more war on the planet means more souls will go into the live stream, just like all the Black Whispers, to be able to become part of the Omni Sephiroth complex. So, by that logic, is <laughs> Sephiroth not bringing these souls into his promised land? And all of a sudden, one scene that I always, always, always like, thought about and thought I had the correct interpretation of. Like, it has been 25 years and maybe for the first time I am seeing it differently. What did you guys think happened at the Northern Crater in OG? When Sephiroth was there and, you know, the clones... They've been following, you know, first of all, they were following and saying Genova, then they started saying Sephiroth. They've been on this long journey, and you know, at the end of Rebirth, we also saw the soul suddenly leaving Nibelheim, right? Boom, they're going to the reunion. I always thought it was crazy when I was a kid. And it's like, <laughs> these dudes have been slow walking for fuck it, the entirety of the game. And then when they finally get to the Northern Crater, after that long journey, Sephiroth just... Slashes them. They start yeeting themselves into the canyon. And I was like, Nani, what? Now, I didn't understand it as a kid. It took me a long time to think about it, And I finally came to the interpretation, but I realised I was wrong. My interpretation, let me know what yours was, that uh, in the Battle of Wills, when Sephiroth was finally starting to usurp Genova... And that's why the clones switched to saying Sephiroth. That, that's when he was essentially separating himself from Genova. He had his own motive, uh, motives and goals. And was actually working in opposition to Genova at points. You know, that they're, they're a relationship of convenience. But there is a part in the path where they split. And that Sephiroth yeeted the clones because he didn't want their cellular makeup. Because I always looked at it in a biological way. You know, the cells going back to the host because if that happened then Genova would become way more powerful 
and its will would re-overtake Sephiroth, so he was stopping that. That's what I thought. Was that a crazy, <laughs> was that a dumb dumb interpretation? That's because I looked at it in a biological component. I thought that the cells would actually have to go back with Genova, but now I'm looking at it in this way. What about the souls in the clones? I think we are supposed to consider this, because before this we always just kind of saw them as like hollow ghouls, right? That there was no person behind the clones. There were attempts in OG to humanize them. This guy are sick, um, an innkeeper, wearing robes and saying, I don't know, I just only got a feeling to wear black robes, even in summer. Is it fashionable? <laughs> they actually joked about it. But what's clear as day is the remake trilogy has wanted to really humanize them. That was, in fact, in Roche's description, they said that Broden, so the innkeeper at Calm, was our attempt to humanize because it's important for the story, uh, the failed clones to us. Then we had the Ultimanias of Lilize, Geddy uh, Barsh, Glenn Reiner, that actually went into the whole backstories. But they said, we still didn't feel like it was enough. You know, We really needed to emphasize this. And that's why they created Roche. Because this was a character that was just there to serve that purpose, that's why they said they went all out. They were like, let's just make him like over the top crazy. Like <laughs> an absolute nutter. And the guy who created uh, Roche's character said it was so crazy to see in Rebirth where he had become as a character because he was just a throwaway at one point. But now to see how much stage time and emotion and weight was put behind it, I found myself coming around to Roche. I was like, oh, damn. He, he's like coming here with like soldier honor. He's going to like team up with Cloud and actually give like other soldiers other military personnel, you know, a route to actually serve the world and not just be you know, <laughs> the Shinra goons and lackeys that we murder in swathes. Nope, nope, he's now a clone. But the, the point remains, right, that we're supposed to look at them as people. That there's a person there. Now, what happens on a soul level there? And all of a sudden, a light bulb went. If the Northern Crater is the Promised Land, which it's described as being for Sephiroth and Genova, basically the life stream in OG couldn't go to heal. That's why the Northern Crater is a big wound, right? It was punctured by Genova's meteor, and that it actually created a pocket uh, life stream dimension that the rest of the life stream was essentially cut off from. That's why that wound can't heal. That's why nothing grows there. That's why it's desolate. Here's the big sphere, that's all of the live stream. Now there's just a pocket promised land. Well, what is the world of chaos now? The line that Zack is on. The, um, uh, the, the, the Beagle timeline. Terrier, I always get these mixed up. What we know is that there's no live stream growing there anymore. Which means what was just Sephiroth and Genova's promised land, you know, gee, just the northern crater, because of all the work that they've been doing in the live stream for God knows how long, the entire world of chaos, we could theorise, we could extrapolate that that entire timeline is their promised land. Zack was in Sephiroth's promised land. And that Aerith's dream day was her promised land. <laughs> oh! The other timelines getting created, I guess, could be say, you could say Zack trying to follow on his dharma, right? His life purpose, his calling, what his spirit is telling him to do. It was to go save them from the building. It was to go save Biggs. And then, pff, new timelines. Are they Zack, Zack's promised lands? If, if that's one of the interpretations of what a promised land is, then maybe, absolutely. But cycling back, and I've got to end this soon because I'm getting lost in the source, um... That made me think, when Sephiroth yeeted those clones, cut them down and they fell themselves in, was it less about the biological cellular makeup making its way back to Dover and that, on a soul level, the reason why they got killed at that exact point is because the northern crater was cut off from the live stream. So the clones dying there at that point on the map would mean that their souls don't go into the live stream. The human soul that does still exist at the bottom of the clone. The soul goes to the promised land the, of Sephiroth for Genova. 
it goes to Omni Sephiroth. And that killing them was essentially adding more and more souls um, and powering him up. Like, like Omni Aerith, like the yellow, the yellow flowers, which really makes me think about that scene. You know, Cloud has seen himself as a clone. Reunion with the cloak. What happens if failed clone Cloud is actually a thing and he gets killed at the portal, the entrance? It's, it's essentially saying the Northern Crater, um, if there is a promised land within the Northern Crater, it's the gates of hell. That was something my brain naturally concluded um, as I was thinking about this and you know, putting in like a biblical sense, because obviously Sephiroth does have a Kabbalistic, Jehovah, um, and biblical uh, references to it, I'd be like, okay, so that would essentially be the gates of hell. And then I remembered a maiden who travels the planet. That's precisely how it was described. There's one chapter where Aerith meets um, President Shinra and Hojo. And Shinra is basically talking about the world that he was trying to create, which is essentially the, his version of the promised land. Again, very interesting because if we tack on to President Shinra the same uh, philosophical standards we're applying to Sephiroth that oh the way he actually sees like his life purpose and and beauty is actually one that the rest of us are like yo you're creating like mass suffering on a scale you're an evil prick President Shinra is a prime example of that he looks at the world that he has created in Migga. He stares at it from the window and he looks at it with pride. He looks at it with awe. His swan song. He thinks that. That is the best version of humanity. And he doesn't, because he doesn't see the suffering. He doesn't actually see it the same as why Sephiroth doesn't hear it. And Aerith meets him. He explains all of that well, in even, even more detail than what we saw him do in Remake. You know, pointing the golden gun at Barrett and having that ideological face-off. Like, uh, who will be the ones to come and help? And all that's, you, you, you know the um, <laughs> you know the speech he gave. Where in Maiden, from Aerith's POV, you suddenly see Sephiroth come up and drag President Shinra. And the way it's described, I, mean, I was trying to remember it, but I had to actually look it up. So, uh, yeah, there's a long trailing scream of terror left behind and President Shinra disappeared. Then Aerith felt a pulse, like a, an alert from the planet Sephiroth. The silver-haired apostate angel smiled thinly as if taking away the wicked souls to hell. This time, Aerith knew the danger wasn't over. The holy she had summoned was being suppressed just as it was about to work. The planet scar from long ago, the, the, the pocket dimension of, of promised land that the rest of the live stream can't access, Sephiroth was in the northern crater that was Genova's promised land, waiting for the moment when he could be reborn as his individual self. He even says the destructive black materia, uh, it describes it as the devil's hammer that would descend from the distant heavens to smash the planet or were summoned biblical references and this is where i started like really looking at um how literal could that be how the next game in this trilogy resolves itself is it going to like perma yeet and delete sephiroth or will it actually give him this like satan rule of the world of chaos and basically there to purify wicked souls because that is the og purpose of sephiroth right like his dharma whatever is divine in sephiroth and i know that's really hard to see right but i think when you see things like him genuinely trying to be a hero as a young sephiroth uh, in glenn lobrook's game uh, uh, what we saw uh, genuinely believing he was going and fighting evil and how sickened by evil sephiroth is that's what's hilarious if you actually look underneath all the evil that he's doing his prime goal was actually to exterminate it. He sees the corruption and spiritual degradation of humanity as so sickening. That, I mean, that's actually why he first believed he was a Cetra, because that was so much more uh, appealing, because that's what he wants. He wants that purity. He wants that freedom. And in a way, he wants that liberation from suffering. And I'll just end this video off by saying that it makes so much sense for the Promised Land to be an idea, a metaphor, a symbol of alignment that is both physical, uh, conscious, metaphysical, um, and universal. It's all of those things all at once. Uh, and that actually, Sephiroth's promised land is just as valid as Aerith's. Because I, I was initially calling it his like fake or his artificial one. It can't be like a real one. But actually it got me thinking of the law of one and the social memory complexes, how it describes. And Buddhism kind of does the same thing. Again, 
Yoga Kara is about mastering the senses and not discriminating. That's ugly. That's beautiful. That sounds terrible. That sounds nice. That person's a bad person. That person's a good person. That discrimination is what invites in a world of suffering. That's what inhibits enlightenment. And the law of one also states that the only real difference between what is essentially be a social memory complex like Aerith versus Sephiroth is how far they can actually go. That actually both are perfectly valid paths. One is just on the path of the positive polarity and one's on a negative polarity. Both are powerful and capable of climbing up to, I think what they said was uh, fifth stage of consciousness, but apparently uh, the negative path, or what we would see as the evil one, that's how we would describe it, Basically, that when you want to get to godhood, you can only get to that in the truest of sense or return to the life stream in the totality. The only way you can get to nirvana and enlightenment is that you have to cast those things off because supposedly the gravity of love, that's what it describes it. The gravity of love becomes so intense if you're still carrying negative karmic baggage. Basically, you can go through stage one, stage two, all the way up to stage five. Um, but then eventually it will get so intense. Your dedication to the path of the negative polarity has to become more and more rigid and strict and obsessive. And of course, that's what we're seeing with Sephiroth is his obsession with it just gets more and more intense. But eventually that breaks. Eventually the stone wall, the gravity of it becomes so heavy that like a star uh, or a black hole, like collapsing, it collapses in on itself. And all of a sudden, it transmutates, flourishes, I think it said, um, like the seeds of Dharma in Yogacara, like instantly blossom. And what was the, the divinity at the center of it? Instantly shoots through. This is like what yin and yang does. That's why there's a white dot within the black sphere and a black dot within the white sphere. That all polarities contain its opposite, just in degrees that if you move too far to one side, the other actually starts to become denser and denser and denser until whoosh and i think that's what's happening or could happen with sephiroth and his uh, conceptual version of the promised land that the world of chaos will be there to present that and that something is going to happen in a huge way in the part three trilogy that will be uh, super juicy to witness super conceptually powerful and interesting i think it will do justice to <laughs> one of video games most iconic villains of all time i don't really want sephiroth just to get yeeted and deleted like i said i want him to be ideologically reconciled i want the uh divine purpose that he does have to actually be shown to us clear as day separate from you know the evil galactic squid mummy Genova. <laughs> i was really kind of peeved to be honest that we didn't really see much Genova, or we haven't really seen much of Genova in this remake. I really hope part three changes this. It's actually what really peeved me off when I saw Sephiroth show up as Glenn Lobbrook, or him and Glenn Lobbrook together. You know, we I emerge social memory complex, because I actually wanted that to be Genova. I wanted it to be the case that Genova was looking to play a wild card against Sephiroth. And that she had basically took over the soul of one of the only other person. Only three people have ever crossed swords with Sephiroth. Glenn, Elf, and Cloudy Boy. Crossed swords by themselves and survived. So Glenn would be a perfect like ace in the hole Genova could play. If Sephiroth tried to take her for a fool <laughs> at the end of it all. Uh, yeah, that's how I perceive Sephiroth murdering the clones at Northern Crater. Now I realise that while that premise of Seph versus Genova has some merit it's not in all of the ways and the areas that i was thinking and it's actually all very different than that potentially much much more nuanced and uh just just way cooler i think a lot of people will struggle to perceive any of this like good guy aspect in sephiroth because of like how strongly um and vehemently square enix have like vilified him and given us that vill a villain persona of him and just how far gone it is but yeah if you strip back to Buddhism, I mean, yeah, that was that Yoga Karik story, right? Maitreya, the future Buddha with the yellow flowers going up against Shakyamuni. I was saying Shakyamuni, I think it's Shak Yemeni. Shak. <laughs> Shak Yemeni? No. I also trying to grow its flowers. It's like even through the path of negativity, they're still trying to attain enlightenment and they're still trying to achieve liberation. Playing Black Myth Wukong, which. If you haven't signed up either from Full Fantasy Peasants or you don't know, I'm streaming that bad boy. Uh, very ironic that there's actually all these like evil, crazy 
sadistic temple masters who fell to this corruption or yogis buddhas or worshippers um no like there's actually evil buddhas in this thing that our character the chosen one wukong has to go up against and yeah in buddhism they, they had figures like this mara the demon uh, buddhism a malignant celestial king who tried to stop prince siddhartha buddha from achieving enlightenment trying to seduce him with his celestial army and the visions of beautiful women there's Versions in Yoga Kara where Shak Yemeni, who I was describing, was actually uh, one of Maitreya's brothers. Yeah, he was the uh, king, uh, his fourth son, and Maitreya was the king's fifth son. Yeah, are not the archangels in, in the Bible also like brothers and whatnot? <laughs> I think it's all awesome, but I just, I had to get that brain dump out. Um, I don't know, I don't know. Is, was that, does that make any sense? Are you guys following? Does that align with any of your... Uh, ways of viewing the promised land did i change anything did i provide any value am i following my dharma am i in my promised land right now is my highest purpose really just to serve crackpot theory juice on a high fantasy game to a bunch of internet degenerates like you <laughs> i'm kidding love you guys thanks so much for watching i'll see you on the next video Kubo.